Well, we now have the results of the survey carried out last month about traffic and road transport in the town. People were generally satisfied with the state of the roads. There were one or two complaints about potholes which will be addressed, but a significant number of people complained about the increasing number of heavy vehicles using our local roads to avoid traffic elsewhere. We'd expected more complaints by commuters about the reduction in the train service, but it doesn't seem to have affected people too much. The cycle path that runs alongside the river is very well used by both cyclists and pedestrians since the surface was improved last year, but overtaking can be a problem so we're going to add a bit on the side to make it wider. At some stage, we'd like to extend the path so that it goes all the way through the town, but that won't be happening in the immediate future. The plans to have a pedestrian crossing next to the post office have unfortunately had to be put on hold for the time being. We'd budgeted for this to be done this financial year, but then there were rumors that the post office was going to move, which would have meant there wasn't really a need for a crossing. Now they've confirmed that they're staying where they are but the highways department have told us that it would be dangerous to have a pedestrian crossing where we'd originally planned it as there's a bend in the road there. So that'll need some more thought. On Station Road near the station and level crossing, drivers can face quite long waits if the level crossing's closed, and we've now got signs up requesting them not to leave their engines running at that time. This means pedestrians waiting on the pavement to cross the railway line don't have to breathe in car fumes. We've had some problems with cyclists leaving their bikes chained to the railings outside the ticket office, but the station has agreed to provide bike racks there. Since we managed to extend the recreation ground, we've spent some time talking to local people about how it could be made a more attractive and useful space. If you have a look at the map up on the screen, you can see the river up in the north and the community hall near the entrance from the road. At present, cars can park between the community hall and that line of trees to the east, but this is quite dangerous for pedestrians so we're suggesting a new car park on the opposite side of the community hall, right next to it. We also have a new location for the cricket pitch. As we've now purchased additional space to the east of the recreation ground, beyond the trees, we plan to move it away from its current location, which is rather near the road, into this new area beyond the line of trees. This means there's less danger of stray balls hitting cars or pedestrians. We've got plans for a children's playground which will be accessible by a footpath from the community hall and will be alongside the river. We'd originally thought of having it close to the road, but we think this will be a more attractive location. The skateboard ramp is very popular with both younger and older children. We had considered moving this up towards the river, but in the end we decided to have it in the southeast corner near the road. The pavilion is very well used at present by both football players and cricketers. It will stay where it is now, to the left of the line of trees and near to the river, handy for both the football and cricket pitches. And finally, we'll be getting a new notice board for local information, and that will be directly on people's right as they go from the road into the recreation ground.
Today I'm going to talk about the eucalyptus tree. This is a very common tree here in Australia, where it's also sometimes called the gum tree. First I'm going to talk about why it's important, then I'm going to describe some problems it faces at present. Right, well the eucalyptus tree is an important tree for lots of reasons. For example, it gives shelter to creatures like birds and bats, and these and other species also depend on it for food, particularly the nectar from its flowers. So it supports biodiversity. It's useful to us humans too, because we can kill germs with a disinfectant made from oil extracted from eucalyptus leaves. The eucalyptus grows all over Australia and the trees can live for up to 400 years. So it's alarming that all across the country, numbers of eucalyptus are falling because the trees are dying off prematurely. So what are the reasons for this? One possible reason is disease. As far back as the 1970s, the trees started getting a disease called Mandola yellows. The tree's leaves would gradually turn yellow, then the tree would die. It wasn't until 2004 that they found the cause of the problem was lime, or calcium hydroxide to give it its proper chemical name, which was being used in the construction of roads. The lime was being washed away into the ground and affecting the roots of the eucalyptus trees nearby. What it was doing was preventing the trees from sucking up the iron they needed for healthy growth. When this was injected back into the affected trees, they immediately recovered. But this problem only affected a relatively small number of trees. By 2000, huge numbers of eucalyptus were dying along Australia's east coast of a disease known as Bellminer associated dieback. The Bellminer is a bird, and the disease seems to be common where there are high populations of Bellminers. Again, it's the leaves of the trees that are affected. What happens is that insects settle on the leaves and eat their way around them, destroying them as they go, and at the same time they secrete a solution which has sugar in it. The bell miner birds really like this solution, and in order to get as much as possible, they keep away other creatures that might try to get it. So these birds and insects flourish at the expense of other species, and eventually so much damage is done to the leaves that the tree dies. But experts say that trees can start looking sick before any sign of bellminer associated die back. So it looks as if the problem might have another explanation. One possibility is that it's to do with the huge bushfires that we have in Australia. A theory proposed over 40 years ago by ecologist William Jackson is that the frequency of bushfires in a particular region affects the type of vegetation that grows there. If there are very frequent bushfires in a region, this encourages grass to grow afterwards, while if the bushfires are rather less frequent, this results in the growth of eucalyptus forests. So why is this? Why do fairly frequent bushfires actually support the growth of eucalyptus? Well, one reason is that the fire stops the growth of other species which would consume water needed by eucalyptus trees. And there's another reason.
If these other quick-growing species of bushes and plants are allowed to proliferate, they harm the eucalyptus in another way, by affecting the composition of the soil and removing nutrients from it. So some bushfires are actually essential for the eucalyptus to survive as long as they are not too frequent. In fact, there's evidence that Australia's indigenous people practiced regular burning of bushland for thousands of years before the arrival of the Europeans. But since Europeans arrived on the continent, the number of bushfires has been strictly controlled. Now scientists believe that this reduced frequency of bushfires to low levels had led to what's known as dry rainforest, which seems an odd name as usually we associate tropical rainforest with wet conditions. And what's special about this type of rainforest? Well, unlike tropical rainforest which is a rich ecosystem, this type of ecosystem is usually a simple one. It has very thick, dense vegetation, but not much variety of species. The vegetation provides lots of shade, so one species that does find it ideal is the bellminer bird, which builds its nests in the undergrowth there. But again that's not helpful for the eucalyptus tree. <laughs> 